Welcome to the first episode of the Language of Video Games. A show that focuses on aspects of the gaming vocabulary that cross from series to series and span multiple generations. For episode one, we're going to be diving into the history of magic and mana. Magic systems and games are probably my favorite part of the medium as a whole. It's what draws me to most RPGs or fantasy-centric styled games. When creating new characters, I'll generally gravitate towards a caster class of some degree, because in real life, I can always hit people with heavy objects. <laughs> Is he gonna have sound for it? But only in games can I conjure up fantastical spells, so it's a unique experience that offers up different ways to interact in the world. A lot of games handle how their systems work very differently, and this diversity makes for nice changes when jumping from franchise to franchise. But a lot of the core things stay the same. Terms like magic or mana meters are often used as the resources. Simple elements such as fire, air, earth, and water typically act as the baseline for casting. And necromancers are wrongly classified as evildoers. I never really thought about why a lot of the smaller details of magic were similar in games. As you start to play more and more games, you see patterns emerge, and instead of questioning why, we tend to accept that as an easy means to know what's going on. The lexicon of language within gaming is pretty strict, since there is such an urgent need to convey as much information as quickly as possible to players without them getting stuck on the basics every time they enter a new world. So these similarities are more often than not welcomed with open arms. But as I dove deeper into why games use magic the way they do, I found that most of the branches sprouted from the same tree. So let's talk about the language of magic systems in games. Magic isn't unique to video games, like by any means. Fantasy authors had been using it for decades before Pong hit houses, and long before that, magic and mysticism had been the center of many stories passed down from generation to generation in a lot of indigenous cultures from all over the globe. Sure enough, like all things in life, when it comes to make systems to cast fireballs, inspiration had to be drawn from somewhere. That said, books and games work very differently. Sure, an author can limit how much a wizard can shoot some bolts of lightning from their staff, but their primary focus is to build tension for passive consumers. When it comes to player agency, some restrictions need to be put in place, otherwise wizards, sorcerers, witches, and bards would become the unshackled rulers of the world. Well, I mean, bards are already OP, but you know what I mean. The idea of magic being something not always readily available to any kind of spellcaster, and instead being a resource has its roots in the Dying Earth series of short fantasy novels released in 1950. Released by Jack Vance, this novella is so influential to how magic systems are used in all forms of game design, it's even been named the Vancean system after him. Even if you haven't heard the term, it's more than likely you've used it before if you've been around the spellcaster block like myself. Dungeons and Dragons famously adopted it from the get-go of the first edition with their spell slot system, and it played such an important role they credited in the back of the player's handbook. Vance was by no means the first to use magic and fantasy, but he was one of the first to put meaningful limits on its use in an interesting way. The Dying Earth series of short stories are set far off into the future in a world where there were once thousands of spells, but now there are only 100 left to the knowledge of mankind. Each spell requires the caster to study their complicated formulas before casting them, and then they immediately forget them. It's an interesting take on how to limit the power of the supernaturally powerful. And it's easy to see how something like this would influence a medium that requires limitations in its agency that it puts upon their players. By the time games went from tabletops to computers, they took their influence from D&D rather directly from Vance and his Dying Earth series. So how did we get from spell slots to mana bars? Back between the late 70s and early 80s, what we would define as a traditional RPG experience did not exist. There were a few attempts at the genre here and there, like Adventure released on the Atari 2600 in 1979, and the text-based Adventure Rogue in 1980, but these were niche cult classics and didn't really have complicated mechanics because, well, it just wasn't possible when you're working with extremely limited hardware. In 1983, the third entry of the Ultima series, Exodus, was released, and with it came a myriad of changes to the games predating it. It was one of the first computer RPGs to use animated characters. It let you control all four of your party members instead of just one, and it was the first game ever to introduce a mana system. Where the previous two Ultima games used a magical item system, where once used, items were exhausted from their capabilities. This new bar meant players could control their own pace of spellcasting, rather than saving spells for big moments. This was a massive game changer that didn't really take effect widely until a few years later. For instance, the first Final Fantasy in 1987 used the now seemingly archaic spell slot system influenced by Dungeons and Dragons. But this changed with Chunsoft's Dragon Quest, or Dragon Warrior as it was originally known in the West, in 1986. At the time, RPGs simply had too much information to display on screen in a cohesive manner for players to really understand what's going on. And when we're talking about console limits, it gets even tighter. 
The solution Chunsoft found was the same thing Ultima and the company's previous game, the Portopia Serial Murder Case, an adventure game similar to those Sierra games. It used a windowed interface. It put everything into an easy to read system from levels, health, and MP. This is where you can really see magic systems start to take a recognizable form. And from here, other games took what Dragon Quest and Ultima 3 did and really built upon them in their own unique ways. Games like Fantasy Star, Final Fantasy II, Mother, and many others used this Windows system formed with Dragon Quest with the two letters MP to signify as one's own magic. So then why a blue bar? Red for health makes sense. It's your vitality, your lifeblood. But blue doesn't really feel tied to magic when you disconnect yourself from what games have conditioned us to think. It's just blue. Blizzard's Warcraft 2 was the first game to feature a blue bar, and from all accounts, the only reason I can see for this is they didn't want it to be green like the original Warcraft's resource meter was. So blue it was. And now magical units had mana as a resource. And boy did Blizzard latch onto this idea and run to the hills with it. Diablo pretty much defined what mana potions, bars, and spell cooldowns would look like for an entire generation of gamers. Even games like The Legend of Zelda started to take on this idea with Ocarina of Time, offering up Link some limited uses in his spin attacks and magical arrows, except opting to use a green bar instead of a blue one. This isn't to say as soon as Blizzard brought mana bars to the masses in a significant way, all other uses of magic went out the window. Some video games still use the Venetian method of limited use of spells, most notably is the Pokemon main series of games, where each attack has an assigned value of uses that can be increased with items, and spells or moves can be learned through leveling up or even taught via the TM and HM systems. The evolution from here on out branches off into many different styles that all seem to operate based on different cultural retellings of what magic meant to them. But one of the most influential and important to discuss here today is mana. Mana has been so deeply baked into the core of video game terminology that it's hard to imagine the entire medium without it. In fact, most people at this point probably don't even know the root of the word and where it came from or even why games started using it. How did the seemingly mundane word become such a staple of video games? It's not like it was some word made up on the spot by a writer to fill a need in gaming. Honestly, for an embarrassing long time as a child and teenager, I thought it was some word picked because, you know, both mana and magic start with M, and it makes for a good abbreviation with MP, where both can easily be interchanged without much thought from the player. But then, at the inquisitive age of 15, I moved to New Zealand. And as someone with a somewhat prominent Māori heritage, I decided to look into my family's background since it wasn't talked about much by my parents and obviously never taught in Australian schools. Being new to the country and pre-internet savvy, it was pretty difficult to uncover what I really wanted. On top of it all, my school wasn't much help either, as it was more focused on churning out rugby stars instead of lending a hand with indigenous studies. So my search didn't really get that far. Hell, even today it took a lot of consulting te reo Māori experts and deep internet digging to find what I wanted. However, in that time I discovered a few phrases and words here and there by sheer cultural osmosis one of them being mana. This was a glass shattering moment for me, and it made me wonder how this Austronesian word was appropriated to become a mechanic in video games. Well, to answer that, we need to go back 50 years, to 1969, when author Larry Niven wrote the first short story in his The Magic Goes Away series, titled Not Long Before the End, where Vance had established almost two decades earlier that magic is not an inherent ability to be used at a whim. Niven built upon this premise that it was in fact tied to the world around us, and overuse of such a thing can be detrimental to the environment if abused. Not long before the end is also the first known use of the word mana within a fantasy context, at least that I could find. This story, and those within The Magic Goes Away, are an allegory for abuse of our renewable resources and how misusing such things will lead to our own demise. There's even a reference to Atlantis draining all of its energy and sinking into the ocean. That said, reading this story, it's easy to see how Niven didn't really become a prestigious fantasy author like Vance, Herbert, or Tolkien. It's incredibly basic in execution, but his use of the word mana and how it ties to inner strength in the world around us was incredibly pivotal for all things fantasy. There are 27 languages that use mana to mean some form of inner strength. It can also mean political strength, authority, influence, and so on. But for today, we will just focus on the inner strength definition. In a lot of cases, this strength or power is said to be inexplicable or supernatural. Robert Blurst, a professor of linguistics specializing in over 97 Austronesian languages, speculates the original meaning of the word to be thunder, storm, or wind, and that then cascaded across multiple dialects and regions to get where we are now. So it's no surprise a word as loaded as this would be tantalizing to use from any fantasy author who would happen upon it. Although video games took hold of this new idea of mana and blue bars, there was one other style of game to take hold of this idea, and that was card games. 
specifically Magic the Gathering, using different kinds of resource cards in the form of different natural elements to cast spells, called lands. From mountain ranges to murky swamps to vast fields, these cards let players cast powerful spells and summons to take opponents down. And this idea has come full circle to appear in digital card games such as Hearthstone, which uses a mana crystal system. There is even a cool little homage to Niven's book in the form of the, I can't pronounce this, Niven Reels disc card, I don't know, which is a nod to the item the Warlock uses to drain mana from all the land in not long before the end. Of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up the mana series of games, mainly the first to make it outside of Japan, Secret of Mana, since you know it's right there in the title. That translation from the original Saiken Densetsu, I'm sorry if I butchered that, for the North American audience really solidified the word within the gaming lexicon. Not only did it bring the term mana to a wider audience, it also isn't a misused term. The story follows our hero trying to return power to his mana sword through mana seeds after humans abused the power of mana for technology, and as a result ran the planet dry of all its resources. It really harkens back to Nibbins not long before the end, as a warning of global consumption tying into indigenous Austronesian mythology, or with a fun fantasy setting. Just uh, don't play the remake. Over time and many different iterations of systems, these ideas with the Austronesian roots have meshed and molded with other backgrounds, religions, and mythologies on how magic works, and it's created some truly interesting gameplay takes on casting magic and the resources along with it. Games like Divinity Original Sin has source in place of magic, meaning you can cast your spells freely as long as it adheres to your action economy, but the source skills use a very limited resource that requires a lot of forward planning and thinking. Or The Witcher 3, which uses elemental runes based in Nordic mythology, but mixes that with the idea of tapping into your inner strength to create chaos to cast spells. I love when games go into extensive backgrounds and histories, tying their narratives to the use of magic in a setting. Like in Dragon Age, the use of magic is through channeling the essence of another plane of existence into the user's grasp to push out into the world. Looking even further, the game explores how magic affects greater cultures. For instance, due to being overexposed to this magical essence, dwarves have become immune to magic as a whole. On the other side of the coin, games can just go unexplained in their supernatural forces, which is a much less interesting approach. I've found that any game that kind of lets magic exist as a core system without any real explanation, while also leaning pretty heavily on it as a story motif, can be pretty detrimental to the overall world building element. Using the Elder Scrolls series as an example, the closest reason that mages and spellcasters exist is that they are able to channel the power of the gods through the stars, which is why I guess some birth signs grant the user higher magical uses, resistances, or even changes how magic can work. I think this is why I couldn't connect with Skyrim as much as the previous games, since it took an already set of simple rules and lore and stripped them back even further, turning inherited abilities gained with signs to buffs you can pick or choose from stones found in the world, jumbling their lore of magic even further. This is never really directly explained, and is instead left up to the player to dive deep into themselves. Even the wikis are pretty sparse, with very limited information about it all. Regardless, this somewhat unconfirmed theory of how magic works is still tied to nature and inner strength. It doesn't go much deeper than that, but it's still a neat little nod, even if unintentionally to the roots of mana. That said, not all games do need extensive backgrounds on magic. It's more those epics that really focus on their world building and histories as a selling point where it feels somewhat like a letdown. The rules of how magic works and why it exists is always a fun rabbit hole to fall into. I think if I were to sit here and rattle off fun and interesting ways magic and mana have intertwined into each other, we would be here all day. For me, learning of the origins of mana, how it ties into my heritage, and how it has been appropriated in video games especially, proved to be a meaningful learning lesson. My feelings on it are best described by this quote by Alex Golob, from a fantastic article that helped me find a lot of the resources used in this video. For Pacific Islanders, the history of mana is important because it is about them, their lives, and their heritage. To video game players, it is important, and for pretty much the same reason. Once an import, mana has now become part of our culture. Some might be tempted to read the story of mana as a tale of cultural appropriation in which Westerners ransacked the culture of the colonized. They may be right. Missionaries, anthropologists, and historians put mana between pages of their books and stored it in libraries all over the world. But gamers did something else with it. They cared for it. They made fantasy games and imaginary worlds, and came to love what they created. They put mana into play, making it part of their lives, dragging it into their histories and self-understandings. They spent hours optimizing their healing spells and living the lives of Draenei shamans. Gaming became part of who they were, and mana became part of their heritage. Did they borrow it? Yes. Did they exoticize it? Perhaps. But by playing with it, they honored it. The world is full of stories like the story of mana, 
stories whose paths across cultures and through time are rarely fully recorded. But these stories matter to us, because their histories are part of our lives. Like mana, they lay in the background until someone shines a light on them and we see the power they truly possess. And before I leave you on that note, I want to lead this video into something else. I was working on how Moldy culture was represented in games, and mana was originally intended to be a small part of that video. But as you can see, it turned out to be a bigger topic than I thought. So while this is all positive appropriation of sorts, what about the negative stuff that is still pervasive in games today? Well, for that, you'll have to see what's coming up later down the line.